Hi, and welcome to this introduction to Pro R2, the latest update to FabFilter's Reverb plugin. Let's start with an upright piano. This is a very evocative sound, but the memories it evokes might depend very much on the acoustic space it's in. If I dial in a small room and turn down the brightness and bring the source closer, the sound might remind you of childhood piano lessons in a living room. But with a larger space and a brighter response and a bit more distance, it might start to evoke memories of hymns sung in a school hall. If I make it really bright and really long, I can create an ethereal, unreal sounding ambience. Let's make it richer and more complex by adding more modulation with the character knob. This has a completely different emotional impact to the first small room setting I started with. Let's hit that freeze button and keep that reverb tail circulating forever. Now, of course, good sounding digital reverb is not a new thing. It's been around long enough that we have revered vintage hardware units. But those old digital boxes' reputation for great sounding reverb is almost matched by their reputation for being difficult to program with many obscurely named parameters and many opportunities to create bad sounding settings. Reverb is perhaps the best example of the maxim, more controls does not equal more control. Under the hood, we have hundreds of individual delay taps, each with their own feedback, level, pan, filtering, diffusion and so on. If a reverb gave us individual control over every one of those internal parameters, it would be totally unusable in practice. So the challenge, when designing a reverb, is to find a way to map those thousands of internal parameters to just a handful of meaningful macro controls, which maximize the good sounding settings combinations and minimize the bad sounding ones. When a designer gets that right, the reverb becomes a much more useful and powerful mixing tool. The ability to quickly and easily fine tune a reverb, especially the more subliminal small room types, is invaluable. Listen to the way this short reverb setting changes the brightness of this acoustic guitar. I'm not changing the dry signal at all, so not really affecting the way this part fits together with the rest of the mix. But lengthening and spreading out those high-frequency transients makes them much more prominent in a way that EQ wouldn't really achieve. In this respect, the FabFilter Reverb specifically tries not to emulate those famous vintage boxes and makes it as easy as possible to tweak presets to perfection or dial in your room from scratch. I mentioned presets, so let's have a look at the new preset browser which we first saw in their Twin 3 synth. We can tag favourites now, which is useful. And of course, there are loads of factory presets to choose from. Personally though, I always prefer to dial in a sound from scratch when I can. And it's the ease with which I can do that in the FabFilter reverb that I really like. While some reverbs allow you to control the balance between the early and late reverb stages, Pro R2 instead provides a distance parameter. This controls the balance between early and late stages but also the way the former hands over to the latter. And it changes the overall envelope of the reverb. Bring the part closer, and the reverb starts almost immediately with a noticeable transient. Or push it further away, and the reverb will bloom in more gradually. Likewise, the simple seeming brightness control changes the sound in very complex and profound ways. Not at all like EQing the reverb, which of course you can do as well. The 
blue curve isn't actually EQ. This offsets the reverb decay time, so you can make specific frequencies reverberate longer, or damp them down to make them shorter. Up to six of these bands are available, making this feature both more powerful and more intuitive to use than equivalent options in other reverbs. That part isn't new, but we now have stereo placement options for the EQ bands. This allows for precise control over the stereo width at all frequencies, which is a very powerful option. If you're creating an Atmos mix, however, or other multi-channel formats, the options are even more comprehensive. Here's what you get with a 12-channel setup. Remarkably, you get all the same options for the decay curve as well, giving you huge amounts of control over the way the reverb behaves for each output channel. And there are more surround options available from the pop-up on the bottom bar. The tilt sliders here correspond to the main reverb parameters at the top, which will be highlighted when you hover over the corresponding slider. Turning these sliders up will increase that parameter for the front of the room, which I've panned left for this example, while reducing it for the rear, currently panned right. This allows you to control the front to back depth of the reverb in ways that I can't demo properly on YouTube, so let's move on. Maybe I'll surprise you by switching to Reaper's stock Convolution Reverb plugin. It's the impulse I want to show you, actually. I grabbed this years ago in a former synagogue turned museum where I recorded a choir on location. And I really like the warmth and depth it can add. But of course, it's just a static impulse, and there's not much I can do to tweak it beyond the EQ. So let's go back to Pro R2's preset browser. But instead of loading a preset, I'll import that Jewish Museum impulse. And now we've got Pro R2's interpretation of it. It's not identical, granted, but it has the same kind of flavor. Actually, we can probably get closer to the impulse by turning down the character knob and removing any modulation from the tail. However, the ability to add movement via modulation is one of the biggest differences between algorithmic and convolution reverbs, so you might prefer to leave some of that in, or add more instead. We can also adjust the new thickness control. Turn this up to increase the density of reflections, which might help to match the sound of an impulse captured in a real room. Or you might prefer to turn it down instead, and create a more sparse pattern of reflections, which might colour the dry signal less and leave more space in your mix. Or of course we can make more profound changes like the room size, or the distance. snare for the next example. Here's a big, large room sound using the modern style, which we know from version 1. But the vintage classic reverbs I referred to earlier didn't sound much like this. They had limited bandwidth due to lower sample rates and naive delay interpolation, and were limited to short delay times which had to be disguised with modulation. So let's switch to the vintage style instead. And what a difference that makes. This reverb, while being much less convincingly like a real space, just sounds good. Especially with a healthy dose of modulation from the character knob. Of course, before we had digital reverbs, we had large sheets of metal with transducers attached. I present to you the new plate style sound bounces around a two-dimensional plane in fundamentally different ways compared to a three-dimensional room, so plates have a unique kind of character once again, and can be great for making things shine or glow. You heard this style earlier on the strummed acoustic guitar part. 
But in this case, I think I'm going to go with the vintage style and lean into the 80s vibe with the new auto gate feature. This is a simplified gate with automatic threshold and, of course, tempo sync options for the hold time. In a similar manner, we have a ducking control, which turns down the reverb whenever the dry signal is present. With an automatic threshold again, so you can deploy this very useful technique without having to mess about with sidechain routings and a separate dynamics plugin. Using a raw sawtooth as an input like this can be very revealing. This is the modern style, with the character turned all the way down. Now notice how the sound changes when I turn up the character knob. We get a gentle, swirly kind of movement. Or rich detuning and chorusing when turned up high. Now let's try the same thing with the vintage style. There's a much darker sound there. And the limited bandwidth is clearly visible on the analyzer. Now let's add a bit of modulation. Then a lot. It's a much more extreme and wobbly type of chorusing compared to the modern style. You guessed it, plate next. It's full bandwidth again, but still sounds dark due to the way the high frequencies decay. Arguably, no modulation will give a more authentic plate style sound. Let's add some anyway. and some more. It's gentle and swirly again, but in a really different way to the modern style. We can exploit this to create effects that sit somewhere between reverb and modulation. Here's that strummed acoustic guitar again. And listen to the rich chorusing width I can add using the vintage style with the character turned up. I'll leave you with a couple of practical tips to help set the blue decay time curve. You can think of this as like an EQ, but one which spreads out and prolongs frequencies that you boost, rather than actually boosting them like the yellow curve. So, when you want the reverb to become an integral part of the sound, like this lead strat part, try lengthening those frequencies that are most important to the part the ones that you may be boosted with EQ on the dry signal, or those that you allowed to remain prominent. Conversely, sometimes you just want to add some space without clouding or muddying the dry signal too much, like on this bass part. Did someone tell you never to add reverb to bass? You can disregard them. You just need to be a bit careful with it. In this case, I've shortened the bass frequencies and also the upper mid-range where we get the clarity. But you've probably noticed that I've also done some work on the EQ curve. Low and high pass filters are often beneficial, but here I've also boosted the low mid-range for the sides while cutting the same region for the mids. This widens the stereo image for those frequencies, which adds a lovely sense of space in stereo and also helps to stop the reverb muddying and confusing the mono down mix. Okay, that's all for now. As usual, there's a comprehensive user manual available via the help menu at the top. 
Or you can enable interactive help hints to get pop-up descriptions of controls when you hover your cursor over them. Thanks for watching.